first with uh, uh, a question which was left over from last week. Um, do runes or any other symbolic signs live their own life in their own world? Or are they present and can be read only if there is also a human who does it? Respectively, does the world of signs work independently from humans? Who gives the meaning to the signs and the things and the events? Um, yes, so the thing is that um, uh, signs and symbols uh, do have a power of their own. Um, and um, this can be seen back in nature a little bit also in, uh, for instance, the golden mean that all, um, all plants, all animals, um, in a way, incorporate already a certain um, uh, relationship to each other within their bodies. Uh, so there's already a, a structure there, and uh, it's, the structure is not uh, imposed by us, but already exists. But um, in a way, it, it's kind of uh, symbols are of an, an intermediary level. So on the one hand, we have the, the formless cosmos in which all kinds of powers exist. And this formless cosmos, um, we translate as human beings into archetypes. So the, um, there's the Jungian archetypes, you have the archetypes of the, of the tarot system, the 22 uh, archetypes of the great arcanum, and in a way also the, the, the archetypical castes. Uh, or the association with, uh, with certain elements. And um, if you look at, uh, at a symbol, uh, what, what in a way is the difference between a, a symbol or a magical um, uh, uh, device, magical symbol and just some, some squiggles or some lines. And uh, often it is not only the shape but also the intention or in a way on what level it exists. So, for instance, if I doodle something on a bit of paper, I create all kinds of shapes. Um, and I can uh, accidentally doodle maybe some runes or some other symbols, but that doesn't mean that they're functional. And in a way, to be functional, they have to be created in such a way that they form a bridge between the power they represent and the physical manifestation of the object. And uh, so these physical manifestations, they can more easily be used by certain powers if they have a certain shape or if there's a certain order to them. Uh, but it is by itself, it is not sufficient. And also the material of which uh, rune or symbol is made, uh, certain materials like copper, silver, gold, iron, uh, they hold different energies so they can make a symbol more strong, but also making a shape out of uh, that material is not enough to make it an active symbol. Um, so in a way to, uh, to really work with it, um, as a human being we have to, to form a bridge to create a translation. And uh, we're not the first ones to do it, because um, people used to be very much in contact with the collective consciousness and with archetypes and with all kinds of powers. Um, so in a way they, um, they saw the, the world as a little bit of a puzzle. So there's different powers, different energies, and if you combine them uh, they form certain beings. So in a way the, the name of, a, of an animal or of a plant uh, is in a way more of an instruction manual or um, a list of ingredients like what is that animal made of or what is the person made of or what is the stone or the plant made of. So these magical languages they um, tell you something about the essence of the thing and because in a way the, the essence has a very strong relation to the word they're in a way similar or connected. And in this way the name of something in a magical language has a power because by working with the name you're also working with the, with the essence. And so certain names have more power, others have less power. Also depending on what level the name is on. So if you look at the earliest magical languages, 
um, so Hebrew and Sanskrit. Um, um, they really have a very, um, very pure, very high level of energy, which is incorporated in the um, in the symbols. And if you go to a slightly lower form, you have the Ogham runes, which are the Druidic language, and the Druidic language is already a little bit more closer to the earth. So instead of focusing on principles like uh, God, uh, creation, uh, light, uh, which are in a way the, um, the associations between um, the Hebrew and Sanskrit and the energy, if you look at Ogham, then you have a relationship which is already much more material. So the different uh, letters of the Ogham alphabet they relate to the different trees, to, to, to the different plants. And they picked certain trees and plants which already also have very pure uh, energies. And for instance, if you go to the Futhark uh, alphabet, which was used in the Nordic traditions of and the Scandinavian people and the Germanic people, they're already, it becomes very much humanized. So it is very much about um, war, power, renewal, inheritance, uh, travel, uh, things which are very much human activities of transformation. So if you look at symbols you can in a way um, see them in, in, in different degrees. So the most uh, pure symbols they relate with the higher powers. So astrological symbols are a very good uh, uh, example of that. So they relate to very pure powers which are actually present in all things. Because um, the planets, they, their energy bodies pervade our energy bodies, but also that of animals, that of plants, that of stones, of our world itself. So they're really basic ingredients. And the same also with the, with the symbols for the elements. They're also very basic ingredients. But these basic ingredients are in a way also passive. So there is a certain energy there, but the energy itself has no path, has no purpose. And this is when we come to the slightly more, uh, more complex languages, or in a way the, the composition of these symbols into words, or into um, greater symbols. Um, so by combining certain elements, a uh, certain um, order can be translated. Uh, can be created and also within that order there will be a certain movement of energy. So by creating more complex structures you're in a way creating movement and you're moving also towards the archetypes. Basically you're saying that the symbol is not just a group of energies but is actually an archetype which is uh, already carries inside itself a path of development a certain uh, way of living, a way of experiencing the reality. So there's archetypes of the man, the woman, uh, the daughter, the son, um, uh, tree, horse, uh, uh, travel, the warrior, the lover. Um, and all these archetypes are in a way personality structures which you can develop in yourself. And by developing these structures you in a way uh, create a tool or a mirror for your own spirit. So instead of being an impersonal glob of energies, uh, it already becomes personalized, it becomes joined with the spirit. And um, so these types of languages which actually create the, the joining of the spirit and the, the motion, uh, they also have a very different uh, effect um, on our being. Uh, so in a way these uh, most uh, primary symbols, they help us to create by combining certain energies, we can create a certain energy structure, a certain being. And in a way this is how um, all things on the earth are created. So in a way energy structures are made, so energetic bodies are made, and these energetic bodies, they start working on the matter so that there is a confluence between the energy and the matter and a form is created, like a dog or a human or a dove or a rabbit. Um, and this is really the first phase of, of energy work. And then that rabbit has to yeah, uh, have a good uh, life or an interesting life for the spirit which inhabits it. 
So this is the secondary uh, set of, uh, of symbols which, uh, which is used. And um, in a way now we step away from, um, in, in our language, from really the, the magical symbols which exist in uh, a collective space and we start moving to the modern languages. And the modern languages are not so much um, languages of creation or of the spirit, but really of the mind, um, of um, in a way our own intellect uh, playing with itself, analyzing the structures which we which we encounter. So the modern languages they help us to create contrast, uh, to analyze things by subdividing them into their constituent parts. Um, they help us to create a sense of me, a personal me, a sense of ego, um, which is not possible in these old old languages. Um, also, ideals can be formulated uh, in that language, and uh, so it's a, in a way a very precise language. But also because it is separated from the collective consciousness and also from the source energies, it's, uh, it does not create. And this in a way also gives us a lot of liberty, a lot of freedom. Uh, because if in, a, in the old languages, if you would say something, uh, it would in a way be true or become truth. Uh, and this is very much also the relationship uh, which people felt with names, with symbols, with pictures, with statues. Uh, so there was not really a separation between the, the high source of the energy and the manifestation of that energy. So in the same way um, a crucifix, uh, which is a symbol, is also yeah, um, uh, Jesus Christ, is the Lord, is the Holy Spirit. It is in a way all one. Um, in the old way, but in the modern way, yeah, um, a crucifix is something to make you think and to make you think of God and to help you to generate a mental image of God instead of being directly functional. Um, so it's very important that if you're working with the symbol to really realize you can work with it on three levels, you can play around with it in your own mind, you can use it to collect, to the collective consciousness and when co connecting to the collective consciousness you're also able to uh, use the symbol to get the blessings and guidance or the flow of the other persons who have also yeah, connected to that same symbol uh, in the same way. So religious symbols very much act as a unifying power to connect to the various egregores, to all the priests and priestesses who serve that symbol uh, to all the knowledge which is connected to it. So symbols can be immensely powerful on the collective consciousness level. Um, and then there's of course the higher levels where you can uh, connect to yeah, the, the creative energies and also to the gods and goddesses who in a way um, are the guardians and guides for these energies in their manifestation. Um, so symbols have very much their own life. And these uh, symbols on the collective consciousness level and on the creation level were already used uh, by many other beings uh, before humans came, came around. Um, but to use symbols on an ego level, that's a very human thing, uh, to use it on a very individual level. Because symbols are by nature in a way a communal, in, uh, uh, a communal language. And also an individual symbol, I can create a very nice symbol, but it will not hold a lot of power if I'm the only one charging it. But if that symbol is in a way somehow connected to an already pre-existing energy, um, then it will be much more powerful. And one of the things you see also with some of the religious symbols is that in different cultures they're actually very much the same, very much alike. Um, because it is a shared language, a shared knowledge. And so when I think of the sun, then I tap into the collective consciousness and all the symbols, all the different cultures have created over time of the sun will in a way be reflected back to me. And this is also what uh, Jung discovered when he started to um, 
look at uh, cross-cultural symbolism, which in a way exists on a level which is higher than our individual culture, higher than our individual awareness. Um, so, although that symbols have a, a power of their own and a place of their own, um, they don't so much uh, have a volition of their own. Um, they're energies, but they're not directed. Um, uh, they're in a way more a directing force. A symbol is in a way a construct, like these energies are in this relationship to each other. Uh, so by using a symbol, you're in a way forcing the energies which you're working with to go into that constellation. Uh, so it's a little bit like an energetic mold for the energy to flow into. So in a way, a word of power uh, or a symbol of power, in a way, manifests that power in a very exact way. Um, so one of the, the methods to use symbols is also, in, uh, for instance, initiation. So symbols can be painted on the body, and by doing this, in a way, the energy body is reshaped, is formed to conform with the symbol. So by writing symbols on a person, you can transform the energy body. It's a very powerful technique for healing or for initiation. But it's also a little bit of a blind technique, because it forces the energy body into a certain structure, whether it is good or not, whether the person wants to or not. Um, so symbols in themselves are blind. They're very powerful tools, uh, but they're in a way not to be used lightly because of their um, inflexibility and unrelenting effect. So, for instance, if you paint a person full of symbols, then their energy body will go into a certain structure. But if there are too many symbols, then the energy body cannot grow anymore, it cannot transform itself anymore because it is locked into place. Uh, so a symbol can open a certain power or stimulate the energy body, but it can also block it. So it's always something to be very cautious about. Um, symbols can be used in uh, a magical way, but also in a mystical way. Uh, the mystical way is quite well known, because uh, many people use tarot cards or um, uh, use astrological charts. And in this way, the, um, uh, the symbols on the cards or in the chart, they carry certain energies with them. They, in a way, are uh, little windows to see the greater energy which lies behind the symbol. And just like a, a, a journalist traveling in a city, depending on where he is and at what time he's looking at the city, he sees different things. But in the same way, these symbols can be windows into the greater energy which they are a symbol of. Um, less known is the, the magical use of the symbols. Because, for instance, if I would do a, a rune reading and the runes are in a certain constellation, they show what is. By moving the runes into a different constellation and doing it with the proper intention, and also by connecting the rune to the proper power, actually the energy of the situation will shift and things will happen differently. Uh, this is again something which should not be done lightly um, because there is a lot of powers involved in creating our karma, in creating what will happen. And there is usually um, uh, a lot of people and a lot of consciousness involved and what will happen is usually uh, like a, a certain weight average of all the desires. So for instance uh, there is a piece of cake, I want a piece of cake, somebody else wants a piece of cake. And depending on how much I want it or how much the other one wants it, I will get more cake or the other person will get more cake. So this is, in a way, the natural balance of things. And by um, using these symbols, you can, in a way, make things happen, regardless of your desire or somebody else's desire. Uh, so symbols could be used um, yeah, for, uh, for black magic. They can also be used for white magic. Um, but it is also a very dangerous tool to use because if you in a way somehow upset your life path or somebody else's life path uh, this is, um, creates a very heavy karmic retribution on you 
and so a lot of your connections you have to actually the powers or the, the symbols themselves uh, might be severed or taken away from you uh, for doing this and in a lesser way we do it by by lying or deceiving others or saying things which are not true this is also kind of abusing the relationship or distorting the relationship we have with the cosmos and um, this this harmony uh, was in, in the Nordic culture also seen as, as a sacrilege um, and it was seen actually on par with k killing your own family members um, so uh, breaking your vow, breaking your word um, is really also creating a disharmony between the higher powers in the cosmos and your own incarnation so if you do lie a lot, if you don't keep to your word a lot then actually you will separate your incarnated self from the higher powers in the cosmos and it will make it impossible for you to yeah to receive blessings and guidings from these higher powers in the cosmos so symbols are not to be used lightly and also magical languages are not to be used lightly and i think also because of in a way the um, desire for um, of humans to be free to experiment to be their own boss to be their own god it's one of the reasons why we moved away from the magical languages to the more individualized languages we have today. Um, yes, yeah, so one other thing um, is that uh, certain symbols can be constructed in such a way that they have triggering events. So that they trigger if a certain type of energy is present. So symbols can be made to act on humans, to act on plants, or to act on animals, or to become active at a certain time of the year, for instance. So there's certain symbols which are active at the equinox, or at the summer solstice, or at the winter solstice, or during a certain astrological event. Um, so these symbols can create very intricate programs. It's really a, a, a programming language, if you will, for energetic structures. Uh, another way of using symbols is in a way to ensure that only people who are part of the same egregore or same group, order or religion uh, get access to a certain energy or will receive a certain blessing. Um, so uh, symbols can also be used to create in a way energetic keys uh, or time locks to, uh, um, to certain places or to certain events. Okay, um, I see here there's another uh, question, which is um, uh, about the symbols in meditations and in dreams. Um, what you see is that people have their own symbolic language, which is individualized on, to a certain extent, um, which is then again part of a cultural language, which is existing in a certain time and culture, which is then again part of the collective consciousness. So when you're dreaming, the first thing, or meditating, the first thing you should ask yourself is what language am I dreaming in or meditating in? Are you tapping directly into the collective consciousness? Are you tapping into the cultural consciousness? Or is this an individual interpretation you're making? And the meaning of symbols changes slightly depending on, um, on what level you're, you're looking at. Um, so one example in the collective consciousness, um, the, the, the symbol of, of harmony is, uh, is blue. It is like the, the order which encompasses all things. So if from the collective consciousness perspective you're looking at the sun, you will see a blue sun, not a yellow sun or a white sun. Um, if you're looking at it from a, a more cultural perspective, well, then the sun will, will have a very different color. It will probably be, uh, be golden, because many cultures made it gold or copper colored. And for them, this is the sun. And on an individual level, uh, what is the sun for you? What associations do you have? What energies does the sun awaken in you? Is it love? Then it should, might be green. If it is indeed uh, uh, order, it might be blue. Uh, if it is strength, it might be red. Um, so you can't really say that a symbol is always this or always that. 
but it changes depending on what level your consciousness is in at the time you experience the symbol. Um, there are some general guidelines to be given. Um, usually the core of something, so the heart or the bones, uh, they often represent uh, the spirit or the higher self, the higher consciousness, the divine part of something. Um, so dreaming about um, uh, you're being boiled down to your bone or having your heart ripped out or eating the heart of something, that usually means that you yeah, have a relationship to, to the spirit. You're actually working on the level of the spirit, the level of the essence of something. Uh, nakedness is also another symbol. Um, nakedness is often a sign of purity, of being uh, truthful, of being without illusions. So uh, often seeing yourself naked um, or a naked child is very much uh, a symbol of uh, the pure self. The, the, in a way the self which is incarnated, which has um, taken form, so it is no longer purely spirit, but it's also pure. It is not influenced by its traumas or um, what knowledge it picked up or what distortions of knowledge and truth it picked up um, during, uh, during its life. So it is in a way the original self, you could say. Uh, the part of you which is uh, still how it is meant to be, the pure, the pure being, the pure essence. Um, okay, um, then we have also the, the symbols of, um, of white and black. Well, depend, that's very cultural. Um, if you look a little bit at the, the, the higher uh, level, so the, the, um, the collective level, usually white is then the, the energy of creation and destruction. Uh, so it is seen as a very high, very pure energy, very much associated with God and the angels. And therefore also because it is seen as a holy energy, it is not meant for human use. Humans should not play around with these energies because they cannot work with them very well. And they tend to destroy things and, or themselves or create things which they don't mean to create. Because a lot of our being is subconscious and we have subconscious demons and subconscious fears. And if we allow this white energy to enter into ourselves, things will be created. So the things I fear or don't want will also be created along with the things I do want. So in general you can say that white energy is not so good for people to use. Um, but on a lower level, um, on a cultural level, white in Western culture is a symbol of purity. Um, in other cultures it is a symbol of, uh, of mourning, of sadness, uh, because when you're dressed in white you can't really go out and work. So it is also a sign of retreating yourself, of separation, of uh, being alone. Um, uh, the black color uh, is uh, in, in yeah, Christian culture seen as, as darkness, as evil, as night. In shamanic cultures it is uh, generally seen as a protective color, something which hides you, which protects you, which shields you, which makes you invisible. And in oriental culture it is seen as the color of joy, of pleasure, of hope. Um, so it is very important also to realize a little bit about your bloodline and also your previous incarnations. Because if you um, start understanding what the color means to you, then you can look into that cultural uh, system for correct interpretations of your own uh, dreams or your own meditations. Um, the brown color is also an interesting color uh, because in some cultures it is seen as the color of decay or the color of rot, uh, but in shamanic culture it is seen as in a way the seed which is waiting to, to, to rise, waiting to grow. So things can really be complete opposites depending on your cultural perspective. Um, so there are a lot of books on, on symbolism, um, on dream symbolism, but you will find that every book says something else and books from different cultures say different things. So in general it is best to stick to your own yeah, cultural paradigm for the correct interpretations. 
and look at your own uh, usually religious culture for what are the, the associations and that will probably work best for you. Okay, so there's um, a, a specific question about um, um, yeah, meditating on uh, on things you see in your in your dreams or in, in meditations. Um, so this is always a very very tricky thing um, because when we, uh, we we meditate we tend to go into the astral and the astral is a meeting place um, and in this meeting place uh, we can create images and we can in a way project ourselves into the astral world and many beings from higher places, but also from lower places, can also manifest themselves, can create images in those worlds. So unfortunately what we see in our meditations or in the astral is not by definition truth. So I could uh, in a way see myself or manifest myself as a beautiful angel or as a horrible dragon or as a demon or as a dog. That's so the manifestation, the astral form, has actually very little relationship to the, to the source. Uh, so that makes, in a way, meditating or contacting things in the astral a very tricky thing. Um, what is very important is if you do meditate or dream or sleep, is the quality of your own energy body and the quality of the space where you're in. So it is not an absolute guarantee, but if the space is clean and you are clean, then probably the things which, yeah, uh, which you draw to yourself or the place in the astral world which you go through will be a nice place. And the same is also true if you're sad or sick or um, the place you're in yeah, has a very negative energy or some objects or some people in the space have this type of energy because then you will be drawn to other places in the astral where the chances of being deceived are much greater, much bigger. Um, one thing you can do if you want to know something for certain about something you encounter in the astral is to ask it to prove itself. Uh, so ask it to do something in the astral world which will create an effect on the physical world. So it can be, uh, it can be seen. Uh, one of the things you should not do is to give it power over you. So something if you see for instance, a spirit, and you think it's a friendly spirit, and say like, well, okay, um, heal me, or show me something, or uh, something like that. Because by doing that, you actually give power, you give authority of your own energy body over to the thing which is introducing itself to you in your meditation. And once given, it cannot be easily revoked. Um, so people can pick up spirits or possessions um, or influence of yeah, all kinds of egregores uh, which yeah, they can't get rid of again. So never give power to yourself, over yourself, to something you encounter in your dreams. Um, what you can do is try to revisit uh, something uh, which you encountered in your, in your astral journeys and ask it for instance to pray or to um, and, or another thing you can do is ask beings which are more at home in the astral world about the thing you see. So for instance, if I'm meditating and I see a dragon, I could ask my, my own guides or my power animal, what do you think that it is? Is it really a dragon? Is it a nature spirit? Is it a higher spirit? Is it a human who is manifesting himself as a dragon? And because they're much more used to um, being in the astral world, their judgment will generally be better. It is also not flawless, but it is a lot better. Um, so it is a very tricky world, uh, the astral world. But until we are able to, to really uh, dissolve our ego and really go into the higher worlds and make contact with yeah, the gods and the goddesses directly, we will have to yeah, function with, uh, with dreams. But ultimately if we can dissolve our ego more, we can really directly integrate into egregores or uh, make contact with deities um, or with greater nature spirits 
instead of having to rely on the astral layer for communication. Ah. Okay. Um, well, this is a rather big topic I find here. Um, it is if I could speak a little bit more about Jesus um, and, uh, and the Essenes. Um, I have to think back a little, but um, in, uh, in Judea at the time there were various um, in a way, religious currents, various methods of, um, uh, of believing, of uh, trying to reconnect to the, to the divine. And uh, I, if I remember cor correctly, the Essenic people uh, were known for being um, very minimalistic. Uh, so they believed that other things, in a way, um, distracted them. And so they wanted to, to yeah, achieve a kind of a purity by having a minimum of heavier energies um, yeah, pulling them downwards. Um, so they were very ascetic people and very uh, focused on, on harmony. And it is said that uh, 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 Jesus of Nazareth was one of them. Um, I cannot be sure about this. Um, because it, the, the evidence I've heard about it is a little bit uh, sketchy. It's a little bit more inference rather than deduction. So some things the Essenes said or wrote about are the same as some things which Jesus said. So it's, it's, it's hard to think about it that way. Um, but in a, in a larger sense, um, it is also a, a spirit type which used to be a lot more uh, present on the earth than it is now. Uh, and by that spirit type I mean ascetic people. Um, so uh, a large group of people have an Atlantean nature, so they're actually focused on, uh, on playing around with things. They're very experimental in, uh, uh, in nature, so they like to experiment with things. Other spirits are more Lemurian in nature, so it's from a previous wave of colonization, and they tend to gain knowledge not so much by looking at things and experimenting, but by just opening up and absorbing things like a sponge. And uh, people with an ascetic nature, they in a way try to cut away everything which is not essence, which is not God. So they try to remove everything lower until only the core remains. And um, in around the, the birth of, uh, uh, of Jesus, about 10-15% of the incarnated humanity was of an ascetic nature but now it is uh, closer to 1%. So this is, in a way, the scenic current is something which has dried up a little bit. Um, so if we uh, look at Jesus Christ, there are um, yeah, there are, of course, various uh, points of view from it. Some of them say, well, he was just a spiritual master, there were many like that, and they all healed the sick, and they all performed miracles. It was very common in these days, so why do you think he's anything special? Uh, if he wasn't crucified, nobody would have noticed. Uh, so this is one perspective. Um, others say that um, uh, he was a prophet, and he was, in a way, just a messenger from the knowledge God wanted us to know. Um, I would say he is a spiritual master. So he was just a man who had some realizations, uh, which was, yeah, was just ahead of his fellows. And he tried to share his experience of the higher worlds. Um, others say he was the incarnation of, uh, respectively, an angel. Uh, a messiah or God himself. Um, and this is rather hard to figure out what is exactly the truth, what is the essence of it. Um, 
because unlike uh, Muhammad, where we actually still have relics available, uh, there are hairs of Muhammad, um, which I had the opportunity to uh, to study, um, and um, of course you, you can always doubt as to the veracity of it, but I would definitely say Muhammad was the yeah pretty much the greatest uh, spiritual master I've ever encountered. Um, but in yeah in case of Jesus, it is more tricky. Uh, because we can visit places in which he went, so we can see the influence he had in these places. But we cannot really um, see the essence of his being anymore. Um, and what I noticed uh, uh, as a very um, strong effect was more the... Uh, because in, in the Hermetic tradition he's seen as more or less as the capstone of the pyramid. So on the bottom is, is learning about strength, about power, about stability, then comes harmony, then comes knowledge, then comes love and compassion. And um, from the places I visited I had most overwhelmingly a feeling of love uh, but not so much of knowledge. I did have a feeling of strength and a feeling also of um, uh, of harmony. Um, so it is kind of a, a tricky thing um, because in one way you can say that um, it is uh, it is almost a, a dual path like once you you take the you've yeah built up your strength you know how to control your own energy body the next step is to harmonize to get into a good relationship with everything else and what then is the next step? So, according to the Hermetic tradition, the next step is to um, develop your knowledge so you can guide your own um, energy body, so you can uh, transform yourself into the being you need to be. Uh, and the other parallel path is to say, okay, now I need to develop my knowledge so I can connect to everything and become one with everything. And I think both are possibilities, they're in a way parallel paths of spiritual evolution, but they can also be combined. And I think the combination is in a way what makes it not so much love and knowledge, but unites them both into compassion. Because love is actually the, the feeling of being one, of being connected, and of uh, uh, that there is no real separation. Uh, knowledge is an understanding of your nature and the nature of the world and um, of the other beings and I think compassion is the combination of the two because compassion is the desire to end suffering but I think for true compassion there also has to be a knowledge an understanding of your power, your role, the, the use of what the other person is going through because if I blindly try to remove everything which I consider bad or evil, then I will probably really unbalance the world and um, stop the spiritual development of lots of people because they might need certain lessons or certain experiences, which I, from my own limited human perspective, think like, oh no, I don't want you to suffer. Let's remove that. Because ultimately, uh, compassion is not so much about... Um, uh, improving the experience. It is not a hedonistic thing like okay have lots of nice cake and cuddles and things like this. It is about um, taking away the causes of, of suffering and in a way we exist here because our spirits are yeah, still learning, still growing and a lot of the yeah, effects we get in our life is because our spirit has no other way of learning rather than manifesting pain or suffering and by in a way finding better ways to, to grow, to transform ourselves um, and in this way compassion can in a way make these heavier vibrations the heavier way of learning uh, unnecessary so that we can in a way start to take higher incarnations so instead of having to incarnate as a body we, with all the human suffering of age and sickness and death and pain, we can start incarnating in higher bodies, in energetic bodies or in divine bodies, which 
have a different uh, path of spiritual development. So, and I think that uh, both the Buddha and uh, Jesus Christ are very much uh, carriers of this um, love compassion impulse. And what you see is that in Buddhism the, the knowledge is very much uh, integrated in, um, uh, in the system. But unfortunately what we see in Christianity is that expect, except for um, yeah, Gnostic Christianity, Hermetic Christianity, a lot of the knowledge has in a way been left behind. So Christianity moved onward without integrating the knowledge which was already present in, in pre-Christian cultures. And this is probably due to the conflict which existed between the Christians and pre-Christian cultures. So they, uh, and out of conflict you usually get a uh, psychological phenomenon which is called the in-group, out-group uh, phenomenon where in a way uh, people seek to distinguish themselves and what the others have is bad and evil and what you have is good and great. Um, so in a way um, Christianity in a way saw the knowledge which existed in the other religions as evil and bad and uh, dark because they did not have this knowledge and instead of rather than really being true Christians and opening their heart and being compassionate and open towards everything they threw away this knowledge and considered it demonic and uh, all kinds of other things and because of that in yeah, modern Christian culture there is a big lack of spiritual understanding, spiritual knowledge and I hope that uh, yeah, this can be more or less fixed uh, in the future because it is not the way things were meant to go, not the way things were meant to be. Um, so this is very much uh, in a way a task for modern Christianity to uh, really integrate the, the pre-Christian knowledge into the um, Christian culture so it becomes a tool for love, a tool of compassion. Okay, I'm going skipping a little bit through the questions here. I'll try to answer two more. Um, so the question is, what is human intellect from the perspective of the human spirit? Does it say something about human uh, spiritual development? Is it possible to have a very intelligent human who has a very low vi energetic vibration or the other way around? Um, the answer to that is very much um, that there is no direct relationship between the two. And uh, the clearest example is in a way also if we look at ourselves and if we look at nature. So we have a, a much more developed intellect than most plants or stones or animals. Um, but our vibration is generally a lot lower. Well, not a lot lower, but lower than that of a stone or a plant or an animal. And this is in a way a, a nice thing, so we can get lots of uh, energies from being in nature and we can charge ourselves that way. Um, but actually the effect is usually a little bit opposite. Um, so, um, yeah, in a way, like, like as one of my teachers put it, is that uh, human intelligence is uh, a spiritually uh, a spiritual disease. So uh, human intelligence tends to harm us more on a spiritual level than it tends to help us. And this is because our level of intelligence is very impure. Um, we are animals, so we have instincts and we are uh, emotional beings, so we have all kinds of emotions. And on top of that we have some rational thought and some ability to categorize and to, to create links. And uh, these three levels are not integrated well at all in, uh, in the human being. Um, so often what we think of as thinking is actually rationalizing emotions or rationalizing our instincts. Uh, so it's not actually um, helping us to see things clearly or to see the truth. 
It is just helping us to see what we want to see, or to feel what we want to feel, or to think what we want to think. So it is in a way more reaffirming us in our lower energies, in our lower patterns, rather than allowing us to move forward. Um, so for instance, if I, um, if I look at my own life, um, um, today I went to work and um, uh, why do I go to work? Well, it is what I'm supposed to do, it is what society expects me to do. It is um, what others do, it is like my, in a way, my group instinct, it is my herd instinct. It is my, uh, my fear of not having enough, it is my desire, my greed to have more money. And um, these are creating all these thoughts like, oh, I should go to work today. And if I would listen more to my spirit, I would uh, probably do something completely different. I would write poems, I would go walk into the forest, I would um, go for a trip with my lover. Um, and I would go into all kinds of other activities which would increase my vibration. Um, so it is uh, meant to evolve into a tool for our spirit, but at the present stage of human evolution uh, it is um, a rather poor tool. It's a little bit like um, when humans started to shift from using bow and arrow and crossbows uh, to using muskets and gunpowder. Uh, in the beginning the uh, bow and arrow you could fire much faster and the crossbow was much more simple, much more reliable because it would take almost a minute just to charge your musket and to try to fire it and often it would explode in your hands. And it's in the same way we're in the musket stage when it comes to using the human mind, the human intelligence. Um, but it is possible, especially if you um, look at uh, uh, the, the Indian uh, teachers um, to um, really observe your own mind, to see how your own mind functions and to condition it to function in a better way. And this is very much the, 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 the use of, um, of meditation and uh, detachment and focusing, concentration. So these three tools, if we can use them well, then we can, in a way, create a mind and a consciousness which is useful to us on a spiritual level. So the detachment is necessary um, because if we have an emotional and instinctive reaction to everything, we're going to, in a way, rationalize and our thoughts are just going to be interpretations of these impulses. And detachment is basically the art of removing your instinctive and emotional reactions. Um, from your thought process. So you can see them, but you don't allow them to control you anymore. And then the next stage is meditation. Uh, meditation is the observing. Uh, the observing of your own instincts, your own emotions, your own thoughts. So you learn your own patterns, you get an understanding of yourself. You become in a way friends with all the different parts of yourself. And slowly, when you understand your own inner machinery, you can get to a level where you can start to use your inner machinery. And this is the level of concentration, where you start using your willpower to uh, change things, to really focus on one part of your being and to alter that. And so this is a very magical practice of really changing your mind, changing your habits, changing um, your nature. And by changing your habits, you also change your karma. You become a different being, being with different tendencies, who has to learn different lessons. And once we get to this level, then actually we can start to guide our own spiritual development. Um, so the, the mind is an incredibly powerful tool, because instead of relying on the, the higher powers, the, the gods, the goddesses, the higher self, the spirit guides to in a way direct our lives, uh, we can start directing it ourselves. Um, because in a way we incarnate and things tend to turn out a little bit differently from the way we planned it. And some things don't work out well. So we all suffer from in a way imperfect lives. And some lives are more imperfect than others. 
and often also from an imperfect understanding of why certain things are happening to us, what things are important and what things we should ignore in our lives. But if our own consciousness, which is incarnated in ourselves, is strong enough, is pure enough, then we can start perfecting our life path. We can start perfecting what things will happen, what lessons we want, at what time in our lives, and our lives can become totally harmonious with our desire for spiritual growth. But I fear that for humanity this is still a long way off. But fortunately we already have masters who have uh, yeah, perfected this art and yogis who can uh, in this way guide themselves and guide themselves towards yeah, states of enlightenment without having to rely on the help of higher beings. And this is also the essence of the uh, uh, Theravada Buddhism and also of um, uh, uh, Protestant Christianity and uh, Sunni Islam that we uh, should have enough power within ourselves and understanding within ourselves uh, to guide ourselves. But if we try to do this without having these powers then it is hubris. We think we have the power of a higher being but we do not and we suffer because of it. Okay, um, yes, there is another question I would like to go into. Um, it's about uh, bloodlines. Um, so, um, there are various, um, uh, very interesting phenomena if it, if it comes to bloodlines. Uh, one of the uh, phenomena is basically that um, a line as a whole is a carrier for a certain power. Um, so, for instance, there is a god or a goddess or some other power who wants to speak to the humans on the earth or who wants to help them or heal them. And um, always within that bloodline or that family or that nation or group of people, there is one person who carries this or who performs this mission. And often when one of them dies, then the next one becomes activated. Uh, so in, in some families it is known that, for instance, the grandmother has the sight and can predict the future and see events and tell things. And when the grandmother dies, it goes to one of the other female members of the family. It can go to a daughter or to a granddaughter or to a cousin or an aunt, but somewhere connected in that same line, there is a certain power. And only when the line as a whole is extinguished, then in a way that power disappears from that line. Uh, something which can also happen is that the quality of the energy bodies within a line deteriorates too much and then also the power cannot function anymore in that line. Uh, so it's also very important to, for a bloodline to be um, active as uh, the carrier of a certain power or god or goddess or other blessing for the earth, that the bloodline should be in a way um, improved or purified um, regularly. So sometimes people also feel that they should um, uh, produce a child with a person who has a certain uh, energetic quality or a certain energetic talent to improve the bloodline again, to restore the bloodline again. Other problems which can happen to a bloodline is also that too much energy becomes trapped in, uh, in traumas, in, um, in curses, in uh, other things which in a way uh, stagnate the free energy which is available to the people. So if you have this pollution of bloodlines then the person is in a way uh, very much trapped by the nature of their, of their ancestry. They can only act out the, the programming which is inherent in the bloodline. They just reenact what their, their ancestors did. And in the positive side it can be a certain ancestral power, in the negative side it can be an ancestral prison. 
so for instance if my ancestors were all warriors and fighters and well then I can end up having a life where there's constant conflict and problems and struggles and this is a very negative effect of the bloodline. But it can also be a very positive thing where I gain a lot of strength and focus and skill in dealing with problems. And depending on the, how much the, uh, the things which happened to the people have been transmuted, have been transformed into higher vibrations, they become uh, useful for, for the spirit or they become blockages. So using your awareness uh, to look at your own tendencies uh, can help to increase the vibration because your awareness comes from your spirit so it's a higher energy which mixes with the lower energy of the trauma and thereby the, the traumas can slowly transform themselves into power, into experience, into knowledge, into wisdom rather than yeah, becoming a pattern which needs to repeat itself and repeat itself all the time. So often the, the more things go towards a formless level, uh, archetypical level of energy, um, the more freedom you experience in, in working with that energy. And the lower, the more earthly, the more crystallized the energy is, um, the more it will be a stumbling block on your, on your journey. And unfortunately energies have a tendency to crystallize if we don't pay attention and most humans tend to be energetically rather lazy. They tend to ignore things and to, to push things into the subconsciousness. So bloodlines uh, tend to pollute uh, more um, depending on the quality of your ancestry. So if your ancestors were very aware and very active with spiritual things, the bloodline tends to be a little bit more pure and when they were only active when dealing with uh, yeah, more lower vibrations then the bloodline tends to be more blocked and um, creating less freedom for the person to act. And this is also reflected in the caste system as I spoke about earlier where the Brahmins should have a very flexible energy body while the Sutras tend to have more uh, heavy energy bodies which are more focused on doing things practically in the physical world with of course the Vaishyas and the Kshatriyas being in between. Um, so there are indeed uh, uh, specific frequencies and uh, also the traumas like persecution they can be carried forward and um, the biggest persecution traumas are in a way with the Native American people and with uh, because the Native American people have been yeah, pretty much like the Aboriginal people hunted to the brink of extinction. So there's quite a heavy um, trauma there. Uh, the Jewish people have a very similar trauma of also being persecuted and hunted for thousands of years. So that's also a quite a heavy bloodline. Uh, there's one thing very fortunate um, because the Jewish people in general and also the Native American people in general they are a rather conscious people they spend a lot of time thinking about things meditating on things so they're very good at clearing up also these bloodlines and I think this also has also helped them to survive um, without becoming completely dictated by their pain or by their uh, by their experiences so there is a, a strong crystallization but there's also a lot of transformation of it so a lot of the persecution has already transformed into strength into awareness into wisdom uh, so out of every experience yeah it can yeah what doesn't kill you makes you stronger if you will um, a bloodline where also there has been a lot of persecution but a lot less transformation is basically the female bloodline. Um, because over the last couple of thousand years we have had a patriarchal society and that meant that relatively powerful women, women who have uh, leadership aspirations or big social aspirations or spiritual aspirations have also been killed, burned, uh, considered witches, and just generally repressed. 
Um, but unfortunately in the female bloodline um, of Western Europe there has not been as much uh, consciousness of the repression and so not also as much antidote for the repression. So that's a process which is just starting up in the last uh, few decades that women start to uh, realize that they also have rights, they also have positions and um, slowly but surely they're starting to reclaim the, female, the feminine power, the feminine potential uh, which is still very blocked. So both in, in men and women the power which is inherent in the feminine part of the, of the energy body is still very much blocked by all the traumas and pain and fear and uh, the idea that it can only function or unlock itself with the permission or by using the masculine instead of seeing the feminine as a power by its own right. And also the methods of uh, spiritual development, even nowadays, they are mainly patriarchal in nature. Um, there's very few schools which really ch uh, teach to work in the hierophantic way, focusing on harmony or focusing on uh, on mysticism, on opening up to other worlds. Most spiritual development nowadays is focused on knowledge, which is a masculine perspective, and on magic, which is also a masculine perspective. But I also see it back in my own teachings. If I teach about knowledge or, or power, I tend to attract about 50-50 men and women. And if I start teaching about uh, mystical topics, uh, it's mainly women and usually no men at all. <clears throat> but um, yeah, in the, in the eyes of society, a person who's just sensitive or can just feel things or know things or just helps is not seen as successful or powerful or worthy as a leader as much as a person who manifests what they want or what they believe or can explain themselves very strongly. So it is still that we regard masculine values as being better or more useful. But in a way our society is just uh, twisted. Um, so also I explained a little bit that indeed uh, with the gypsies the, the, uh, the talent of using the eye is, is very strong. And you find actually that uh, along the road the gypsies traveled all the way from India uh, yeah, through uh, Persia uh, to Eastern Europe. There is this whole tradition of uh, the evil eye and being afraid of the evil eye. Um, so it's also interesting how, in a way, their skills have found their way into, into stories, into folklore. Um, but the gypsies are not the only ones who have um, very special talents. Um, because uh, um, one of the talents which is very strong in the, in the Germanic bloodline um, is in a way the ability to, uh, to focus, to persevere to be very single-minded, to have a lot of devotion, if you will, to a certain path or to a certain way. Um, so it's very different from the, the perfection, which is in a way very strong in the Japanese bloodline. Um, in the Japanese bloodline, um, people um, see that the divine is in everything. So you can reach a higher level of awareness by uh, making paintings, by making tea, by fighting, by making love. In everything there is uh, a higher vibration and in everything you can look for the higher vibration and in a way looking for this higher vibration is the journey towards perfection. Um, but in the yeah, Nordic tradition it is more a bloodline of um, becoming one with the journey, so becoming one with your, your own story, with your own travel. Um, so you can follow the path of the monk or the path of the hero or the path of the martyr. And in a way by doing this everything which happens in your life will be a reflection of that spiritual path. And that spiritual path is meant for your transformation. And depending on your own level of consciousness 
the things which happen in your life will just be become blockages or will turn out to be strengths. Uh, so this is a very northern European talent of in a way um, crystallizing yourself into one spiritual path. Um, and it has its advantages and disadvantages but in general you can say that um, people from the Nordic tradition are a lot less flexible than, than other humans are. Um, if, for instance, we look at the, um, um, certain uh, more Celtic or Pictic traditions, uh, there is a more uh, stronger bloodline of um, having a friendship or a relationship um, with nature spirits. So this is also a very strong uh, inheritance which still exists uh, uh, very strongly in Ireland, Scotland, Wales and to a lesser degree in the parts, in the parts where the Celts are overrun um, so in, in, in France uh, and in, uh, in England um, but also this, um, in this bloodline there's also the ability to attune to that specific frequency, to that specific part of the cosmos. And also in the Nordic tradition, many people of the Nordic tradition and also in, um, in Eastern Europe have this ability to connect to their own uh, gods and goddesses. Um, so this is also a very specific vibration which you can see uh, in a person. So the bloodline is actually energetically visible or energetically de detectable. Um, if you uh, scan the energy body to see what connections it, uh, it makes. And um, ultimately by the mixing of bloodlines um, it can become rather confusing because we get more and more potential talents but it becomes a lot of white noise because there's not so much a single talent which stands out so, so strongly anymore. But it becomes a little bit muddled. Uh, that this creates a lot of freedom for the spirit to develop itself in whichever way it wants to but it is also harder to develop itself because there is less of a talent which drives it forward so the spirit has to work a lot more in these modern times uh, to be spiritual than just inheriting its spirituality from its, its family, from its bloodline um, so this is a very interesting phase in, in human evolution where we are no longer predetermined by our caste or by our culture or by our bloodline but um, really have to shape ourselves um, by the power of our own spirit and this is very much also what the Archangel Michael is trying to teach us to focus on our own divine core or our own essence and to use this essence as a guide to manifest ourselves, to create ourselves. So what it says in the Bible that we are created in God's image is in a way something which we are only now starting to carry out. Um, which, because before these lower vibrations, these inherited vibrations were the dominant ones. But um, we have to try to get enough awareness so that we can in a way um, control ourselves, dominate ourselves instead of being dominated by our past but the dominance of the bloodline was also our guidance which we are now lacking so many people are now very confused because our minds are still not able to comprehend and to see clearly enough because we have not enough detachment we have not enough skills at meditation, not enough skills at concentration and at the same time these impulses which guided us are starting to go away so we're in a very much in a twilight zone as a human race at the present time so i have not been able to to uh, to make contact uh, well with all questions but at least i've answered some questions of everybody so there are a lot of questions which we are remaining i will email them to you uh, later uh, what i would like to do is a small meditation um, on basically the, the border uh, between the, the, 
the Christian impulse or the Buddhist impulse and the, um, the knowledge impulse which is the hermetic tradition or the, the Krishna consciousness in the um, uh, Vedic tradition. So go into a relaxed position and our minds are still very active running around from hearing all the information all the associations and try to bring all that knowledge which you have to your heart don't try to silence it but try to connect it and try to feel the knowledge instead of just think about it. Try to integrate the two so that your heart can react to the vibration of what you just heard. So that no longer your knowledge pushes away your emotions but rather invites them by joining your emotion and your thoughts you get transformation because only the thoughts they stack up like junk in your attic but they don't create spiritual development by themselves just confusion but by integrating this knowledge and bringing all the knowledge to your heart it can transform your spirit and thereby transform your entire being. Now that we have this small internal integration, we will try to integrate what we know and feel into the collective consciousness. So try to open up to the sea of ancestors which came before you. See if you can do the same process with them. Because all these ancestors have spirits and they have experiences. And try to use your own heart as an example, as a workplace, to get all this knowledge from the ancestors and let it pour into your heart and also all the love and feelings of your ancestors. Also let them pour into your heart. So that all the energies from your whole line can start their process of transformation, of becoming spiritual knowledge rather than just earthly knowledge or earthly vibrations. But if you feel that your heart is getting too heavy, that the vibrations are too heavy for you, then invite the higher powers to help you. Invite your guides, your angels, your gods and goddesses, your own spirit. Pray for assistance in this process. Pray for guidance. And let this golden light come into your heart and help to fan the fires of growth, of spiritual transformation. Feel that you, as a human, can in this way really clear up your bloodline which will also benefit your brothers, your sisters, other people connected to the same line because you are also connected through that line with all your brothers and sisters it's a collective pool, it's a collective energy it's not an individual energy but as an individual you're just 
coasting along on this collective current. But you're not just a ship being dragged along, but you can also control the current, make it go up, make it go higher. And if enough of us do this, then the collective knowledge of humanity will become spiritual knowledge, spiritual wisdom. So this is a very good exercise to share with others and to do with other family members to clear up all the patterns which are disturbing you, which are trapping you. Thank you very much for listening.